She's a second generation vet, a dog wrangler, and a cowgirl. One minute, you've got an emergency C-section on a chihuahua, and the next minute, I'm out semen testing bulls that weigh 2,000 pounds or more. Not my favorite job. Meet Dr. Carey, a prairie vet on wheels. I literally have my phone with me 24 hours a day, every single day of my life. <laughs> It's well into calving season, and it's been 24-7 for weeks on end for Dr. Carey and rancher husband, Calvin. We're at Calvin's uh, family farm this morning. Well, Dad was born here in 1944, but his family have been in the area for longer than that. Calvin's great-grandparents emigrated from Iceland in the late 1800s, and in the 1930s, they set up a small family farm on an isolated island in Lake Manitoba. To keep up with the times and expand, Calvin's family had to leave Birch Island for the mainland, where they now farm 7,500 acres. They've got 600 head of cows and close to 600 head of calves. 1,200 head of cattle means a lot of vet work for Dr. Carey. And this season, things aren't getting any easier. This calving season's been a little difficult because Calvin's dad just passed away. Um, so that's been um, a little bit more tough um, for us. But, um, um, but usually his dad would have been up two hours ago already feeding cows and checking pens, making sure the calves were all healthy. Now, um, Calvin and his sister are doing all of that. I've been coming to help when I can, when work's not crazy. Without Calvin's dad to help, and with a huge herd of cattle to feed and care for, the work on the farm never ends. A typical day in calving season consists of uh, getting up in the morning after sleeping off and on through the night, checking cows, make sure nothing's calving, feed for a couple hours, then go check cows again, tag some calves, process some calves, check cows again, maybe find time to run into the house and throw a piece of toast and an egg down your throat. Um, well, when you're really busy, you have to throw it. So the first thing that we do is uh, give them a tag that corresponds with their mother's tag. We tag the calf, uh, there's ridges of cartilage, so we make sure we get in between them. And there's actually a little vein that runs through there and we try and miss that as well. Just a quick snap. This is the government ID tag. It's actually a radio frequency tag. It can be scanned, uh, very similar to a microchip in a dog. Snap. We use a numbering system for the cows and calves, which lets us know how old they are. So um, the C's this year are heifers, so they're first time calvers. They've, they've never had a calf before. You know, his mom doesn't have a tag. We just know who she is. <laughs> a very special cow is the oldest matriarch of the herd. This is Hungry Joe. I think Kevin had just named her Joe. And then I had gone in to feed a bottle and she just about knocked me over getting the bottle. She normally wouldn't still be here on the farm, but she's kind of a pet. She is 17 years old, and they don't usually have pets, but she's a pet. She'll never leave the farm. So this is Hungry Joe's <laughs> baby here. He's not quite as tame as she is. She's not a heifer. She's a cow, so she knows that this is her calf. She knows the whole process that kind of goes on. She's been through it before. Hungry Joe has had 14 calves and has a special role on the ranch. That's the reason we keep a couple of these old quiet cows in with these young first calf heifers is to try and uh, try and keep them a little bit more quiet. But a quiet birth is no guarantee that a healthy newborn calf will stay that way. Carrie's just been called to her Ashern clinic to deal with an emergency. We've got a calf here today with a broken front leg. 
they actually saw it happen. The calf somehow got itself caught in a bale feeder. Carrie's a great vet, and she's done lots of work for me in the past, and uh, we really appreciate her here. Newborn calves' legs are naturally very soft and prone to injuries. So we're broken about here, so ideally we would get a joint above and a joint below the break, but because it's up in his elbow, we're not going to be able to get that. For treatment, padding and a solid cast are applied. We're going to be coming up with the casting right about in here. If you hold at his toe. As we cast, we just uh, figure out the normal anatomy of the leg and um, make sure that the fracture is lined up properly and that it's stable. All right, you guys are good to go. In two weeks, they'll bring it back. We'll cut the cast to make it bigger so that the calf can grow. The calf must now be kept in a clean, dry pen to avoid sores and infection. It's barely out the door when another emergency rolls in. This time, it's a young heifer facing a difficult birth. Hello. This morning, we seen that the water bag came out and left her for a couple hours. Passing the water bag, or placenta, signals that it's time for mom to start pushing. Normally, the calf's head and front feet emerge first. Then I put her in the head gate and I checked her and there was just the head was there. Which may mean the calf is too big, so there's not enough room for its feet. Usually on a small animal like this, I was in with bigger bulls that throw heavier calves. It's, a pretty, it's pretty risky to try and pull them yourself. This cow is small and normally wouldn't be bred for a few years. But this absent-minded teenager slipped into the bullpen. As a result, she's now facing a very tough birth. She snuck through the fence, and this is, she's paying for it now. The calf's too big. When a small cow mates with a big bull, the risks are serious. The calf may be too heavy for the cow to deliver naturally. So if I would have tried at home, I would have probably maybe killed the calf and hurt the cow. Eh? She's not dilated, Laura, like at all right now. So you come in, give me a hand, because we'll have to mess with this a little bit. Her cervix isn't dilated. They'll do that sometimes if the calf doesn't come in the right position, then they don't dilate properly, because the calf, usually, they need that two feet and a head there to, okay. to stimulate the cervix to, to open up. So her cervix is not opened up, plus it is a decent-sized calf. Just like a human birth, complications can arise, and time is of the essence to save both mother and calf. So we just got a chain on each foot here, and I'm just doubling them up because we've got to put some pressure on these chains to pull this calf out. So when we double up um, the chain, we just have less risk of fracturing a leg when we're, when we're pulling. For the calf, it's a matter of life or death and Dr. Carey is working against time. It's a struggle to get the calf out because the heifer's cervix is still closed. We need both feet and the head to be coming into the birth canal. So if I start pulling on this calf now, basically all that's gonna happen is this head's gonna slide back and not be coming properly. So Carey makes a quick decision. She'll try a standard procedure designed to force the cervix open. If that doesn't work, the only other option is surgery. Uh, just hop out, Lauren, because oh, okay. if she flails around, it's easier for us to get out of the way if there's not a bunch of us in here. We're just trying to put pressure on that cervix to see if it'll dilate on its own or not. I need her to freaking dilate so we can pull this calf. Does the mom come in? She's not dilating, Lauren. So will the heifer and her calf survive?
Dr. Carey is desperately trying to deliver a calf naturally. But if the cow won't dilate, the risks of death or injury are high. This heifer that Carey's working on here, she got into a long pasture last summer, and she got in with the bigger bulls. So that's where the problem is. She can't, uh, can't calve, eh? She's not dilating, plus this calf is really big, so we are going to go ahead and do a C-section. For both animals and ranchers, calving season is a constant battle between life and death. I don't have that many, so I kind of know them all. We keep them right from born to, like this one here, she'll be a mother, eh? It bothers us if we have something happens to them. It's our livelihood. So right now, um, we're prepping this cow for a C-section, so I'm doing what's called a paravertebral block. So you block at three places, and then it's gonna freeze the whole surgery area. Blocking, or freezing the heifer, means she'll feel no pain during surgery. And so that takes a few minutes to work, so basically at this point, I do my freezing, and then I do my other prep work, and by then, she's not gonna feel a thing. You can actually see steam rising off of her. So that's a really good sign that my block worked. I also take a needle and I do some test pokes around the area too to ensure that she is frozen because we do not want her to feel anything. So. She's pretending she can't feel it, so we'll see if she's lying. Sometimes they wait till Carrie comes and then they, they tell her that it didn't block them properly, but you can't always trust them. But she's not feeling anything right now if we poke her. Now, it's up to Dr. Carey to get the calf out as quickly as possible. This is the room in here, this big, giant, huge sack that's filled with hay. And then, luckily, the feet are right here. Make the incision through the uterus, through the placenta. And as soon as I get these feet Popping out, we will pull this cap out. Just pull straight towards you. Yep. Just like an emergency C section in a human mom, timing is critical. But this time, it may be too late. Let me have a feel. Nothing. No. Nope. Sometimes when they don't dilate, it's because there's something wrong with that calf. Because the calf secretes a steroid that signals that cow to open up properly. And when they don't open up properly, it's because it's often because there's something wrong. Losing an animal is never easy. And as a rancher's wife, Dr. Carey knows that this is a devastating and costly loss for the rancher. And it's tough not to take it personally. I blame myself, first off, like it's just my nature. Um, but the, you know, the likelihood is that it just wasn't a viable calf and that's why she didn't dilate and that's why she was here in the first place. So probably not my fault, it doesn't make me feel any better. Although losing a calf is uncommon, rancher Lorne has had some bad luck. He's lost one calf at home already this week. I kind of feel sad because we lost this calf, another calf, it's two in the last week we've lost now and it, uh, it hurts, like, you know, it's, uh, it bothers me. It's not good. Mm. There is a life cycle when it comes to calving out cows. Uh, sometimes things just don't go as planned. You'll get uh, stillbirths or weak calves. We do try and do our best to get a live calf out because that's what we do. But unfortunately, sometimes the calf is just not viable for various reasons. And sometimes you just can't explain why. When faced with this dilemma, ranchers often try to make the best of a bad situation. 
we're trying to adopt a calf onto a cow that is not hers. This is an instance where we had this cow calving a couple of days ago and there was complications and the calf was born dead. But we had this calf who didn't have a mother bottle feeding it two or three times a day. So we did rub the fluid of the, uh, and the placenta and such over the, this calf. Sometimes cows are really smart. They know when you're trying to give them a calf that's not their own. So in this instance, I don't know that she was sold that this was her calf. But it seems like a lot of things, if you give it enough time and you, you know, encourage them to get together, eventually it may become that they'll accept each other. You go into calving season knowing that there, you're going to have losses. So in an instance like this, when you have a calf without a mother and a mother without a calf, sometimes you try and get the two together and make two individuals a pair. There's all kinds of loss on a cattle farm. You can't go through a calving season and not have losses, but you just try to keep your eye on them and pay attention to what's going on and try to save as many as you can. As Dr. Carey knows all too well, that loss can also include mothers. We are at uh, Dave Budge's farm this morning. He had a cow calf last night. Basically, she's prolapsed her uterus, which means if they're heaving a lot, they can push their uterus fully out. So it is an emergency. Time is of the essence. So we need to get in there and hope this one is nice and easy this morning. Last night, she calved about 10.30. And the calf was weak, eh? I put it in the pen, and then I waited for a couple hours, and then it couldn't get up. So I fed it some costume with the bottle. And then I went to bed, and I got up this morning, and this is what happened. There's two great big arteries that go into that uterus, so when it's prolapsed and all that weight is pushing on those arteries, they can tear and they can rupture and bleed to death. This one's going to be a little bit difficult because it's been a while since she's calved, so the uterus gets swollen, so I have to be really careful as I'm pushing it back in that I don't stick my fingers through it and cause a, cause a tear. It all adds to the challenge of this job. I don't think anybody likes these. She's still nice and bright and alert. Her ears are still up. She's still perky. She's still fighting. She looks fine. We'll just give her a shot of long-acting antibiotics so that she doesn't get infection, and then she is good to go. The procedure is a success. Dr. Carey can leave knowing that this mother and calf will survive, something that carries her throughout the season. Two weeks later, at Dr. Carey's clinic, Farmer John and the calf with a cast are back for a scheduled checkup. on this calf two weeks ago. It has a high fracture, which is an issue because ideally with a cast, we want a joint above and a joint below. Because the joint above this fracture is in the shoulder, treating the injury with a cast is a calculated risk. The best fix would be surgery to insert a metal pin, costing thousands of dollars. Money most ranchers just can't spare. So the question is, has the risk paid off? The cast is nice and clean. If it came back and it was all muddy, then John would get in big trouble. The fracture is healing nicely. It's nice and stable. So that's what we want to see. Just put a little bit more cast padding up top here. It's probably so itchy. They usually are like super itchy. They're like, please, while you have that thing off, scratch it. Sorry, calf. Next time. We just use the same cast as a splint now. So we just uh, loosen it off. But we don't recast financially. It gets really expensive to do that. If we didn't take this cast off after two weeks, 
just it's tight so it's we want it tight for it to heal but um, they grow so fast when they're young like this that um, it would start to cut off the blood supply to his leg so that, that would not be good so it'll be six weeks total healing time and then he'll be good as new With the healing calf now on its way home, Dr. Carey heads back to the family ranch to lend a hand. Calving is a rough and tumble job. Yes, there's always hazards to the job. If it's uh, not bumps and bruises, it's torn ligaments and shoulders and everything else that goes along with it. Sometimes calves don't get processed when they need to be at a few days old, so when they get to be a week old or older, they get super fast and smart, and so catching them can, can be a bit of a rodeo on the pastures. Getting kicked in the face, I tore my rotator. And surgery. And surgery. And whiny. Yeah, you were very whiny. <laughs> That's the fun part. People get pantsed. <laughs> I lost pants once. <laughs> calving season is it's hard on the body you get banged up I got kicked in the face a couple weeks ago luckily it wasn't too bad it just hurt my pride um, but I've torn a bicep torn a rotator you know as well as other just bumps and bruises sprains and kicked in the nuts I don't think that's ever happened getting your nose bust open by a <laughs> One day old uh, 90 pound calf is a little humbling. <laughs> <laughs> a damaged nose is bad enough. Filling it with this particular odor is something else again. A lot of my work, especially at this time of year, involves cow poop and it just is part of the job. <laughs> But in the summer, if I get poop on me, I hate it. Like, cow poop is for springtime and fall. That's it. When I get crap on in the summer, I'm just like, ah, there's flies, and it drives me nuts. So, yeah, I get really sucky about it at certain times of year. It's a long time family tradition. And this year, it's also a tribute to Calvin's dad. Transporting the strong and healthy herd he helped build to the island farm. And there are a few things to celebrate as well, like the end of another backbreaking season. With all the hard work, hard labor and stuff that comes up in calving season, there are definitely good points to it. And the biggest one is usually by mid, mid May or end of May, it's over. <laughs> there are such good parts about the calving season, you know, getting to be out here on a sunny day and just walk through the calves and watch them run, watch them jump. It's satisfying. Forget to see what you're doing. Dr. Carey and her husband Calvin have supported each other through 17 calving seasons. It is tough in calving season, just uh, the separation part. We make it work, but it's not ideal, I guess, but it's just what you do because it's calving season. Calvin and I complement each other well. We got married in 2003. He always has to remind me what year it was. I'm more introverted. He's more extroverted. He's the people person. I'm more high intensity. He's a lot more laid back. So the cows, they, they really don't mind the barge ride. They um, get a little worked up right when they first get on because they're kind of sliding around and pushing for the best spot on the, on the barge. They um, do that for five, 10 minutes and then they settle down and, and just enjoy the ride. I've always been an outdoorsy kind of person. I'd rather be outside doing something than, you know, inside sitting on the couch being able to look out in these nice wide open spaces where there's nobody else around is is definitely um, something special. It's nice with the lake here to, to have that kind of peacefulness. It's a lifestyle that people love. 
you're your own boss and you're living out on the land, get to appreciate nature every day. Sometimes not so much when it's minus 40, but when it's a beautiful day like today, you get to be outside all day and in the fresh air and there's really nothing better than that.